discuss it. So really, I mean, this brings us back to the main issue of the debate. And it was how you know anything unless you start with God. Mm -hmm. And my question to you in the debate, the first question was, could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Right. And your answer was yes. Right. In the debate, you're, you're correct. My answer was, was yes, based upon what my definition of knowledge was. Right. Justified true belief. Right. And we agreed, justified right. true belief. However, what we, what we count as justification, I think, differs. Absolutely. Right. So, so, in effect, even though we have the same terminology that we use for a definition of knowledge, because ju ju justification, what counts for justification is different between us, then knowledge, what right. we understand as knowledge, ends up being different. So, when I, that's why I qualified it is, uh, my answer in that case is yes, because the axioms that I talked about, the, the base from which everything else is built, uh, are not knowledge because the reasons that I accept I exist, for example, as an axiom, uh, is doesn't fall under what I would call as a justification. Right. There's a reason, and the reason is the impossibility of the contrary, but it's not a knowledge claim. So everything else, which is built built upon uh, either my ability to reason or evidence that comes in, those are all knowledge claims, and because I'm fallible, then yes there's a potential that any of those could be in error. Now, there's also a way that you could answer, I could have answered, uh, no. No, I can't be wrong about everything that I know. If, for example, I was using what I think is your criteria for justification, and that is uh, either a, a circular argument is justification uh, for believing something, or the impossibility of the contrary is justification. In which case, then, Yes, those, those axioms would then count as knowledge, which I cannot be wrong about. So it's, again, it depends. It's like the uni question. You, you, I can't answer yes or no unless we understand which version of justification we're using to support. The right. Knowledge. But your ending, from what I understand from the video, your way to get out of the infinite regress, because I explained the infinite regress. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, I know something, I know A, well, because of B. I said, how do you know B because of C? And I said, well, you would have to escape that infinite regress in order to know anything. And the way that what you used as your bedrock is your senses. Would you agree with that? Well, one of the axioms is that we take our sense information as provisionally valid. Right. Right. Okay, now that was the bedrock with which you built your knowledge claims on. And you admitted that you could not know if your senses were accurate. You could be being deceived. That's true, my senses may be deceived. So all of your knowledge is built on an assumption. An assumption is something which is accepted on blind faith. No, because, because of the impossibility of the contrary. Okay, now one thing you that, did... That's why it's not arbitrary and that's why it's right. not blind faith. Okay, but is it impossible that your senses are not valid? Is that impossible? It's, it's possible that some of my sense information uh, was incorrect or, right. or invalid. All right. So that being the case, because there are any people, you would admit that there's people in this world who have invalid senses, who cannot use their senses and reasoning to come to logical conclusions, right? Uh, yes, those that are mentally ill, for example. Right. right. Yeah. Now, if such people exist, they could say the same thing as you do, as that I start with the axiom that I have to accept my senses and reasoning as provisionally true. Absolutely. But every conclusion that they come to would be false. Because their basis is false. It may be, but how do we judge that their conclusion is false? Well, my question is, how do you know you're not one of those people? The, the way that we... And, and it's true that I may be one of those people. Right. But that doesn't mean I am one of those people. Correct. However, when you may be one of those people, you realize that you've given up knowledge. That's not true. Okay, now, we'll, we'll get into the uh, a topic of truth. Right. But, but the thing is, if you say that you could be one of those people, so it's possible that every clued conclusion that you come to could be false. That is a possibility. That's a possibility. Okay, now that being the case, that means that you can't know anything because knowledge, as we said, is justified true belief. So you cannot know something to be true which might be false. And if you think you can, I'd like to have an example of that. You know, what you're doing is you're setting up a criteria that whatever you know, you have to know with absolute certainty. Well, I'm asking how you can know it to even 1%. And that's one thing that I take exception with the video. I'm not talking about absolute certainty. I'm saying how can you know anything to any degree 
when you cannot know that you're that you're not one of those people. You can't know anything to even one percent to one thousandth of a percent if you don't know that you're one of those people. The 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 problem with uh, the the problem was with certainty, which is where this is driving to. The problem with certainty is is that we know things with degrees of certainty. Now, when you the problem with is certainty with absolute certainty, the impossibility of, of having error, is you can never actually get there. And again, because you said, because the sense information could be wrong. That's why we continually take back uh, what we believe that we know. We continually evaluate against new evidence. However, you're and doing I, that with assumptions that you cannot justify. Well, and therefore, you can't know something to one degree of, of knowledge, to one degree of certainty, because it's based on nothing, on a foundation of nothingness. No. The, what we're doing, when you say justify, you would be the definition right. of whether it's your term for justification or whether it's my term for justification. Um, and, I, and the way I use the, the term knowledge and justification and the axioms, the axioms are technically not just justified, right. but there is a reason for believing them because of the impossibility of the contrary. No, but so that, when, that's where we start. When you yes. say impossibility of the contrary, right. you realize that's a certain knowledge claim. Impossibility is certainty. When you say something is impossible, you're saying that certain that that cannot be the case. Would you admit that that's what impossible means? What, well, you said it's a certain knowledge claim. It, it's not a knowledge claim. No, but to say definition. something is impossible is to say it's certainly not the case. It cannot be the case. Correct. Okay, and in your video, you denied certainty. I denied certain knowledge. Okay, so what is certainty that's not certain knowledge? Well, certainty is, for example, the axioms. Okay, now my question, which is the question that I ask online that I can never get you to answer, is how do you know that those axioms are certain? They're not knowledge claims. And <laughs> I know, okay, but the thing is, so the basis of your worldview is something that you don't know and could be false. Because it's not a knowledge claim, but that doesn't mean that okay, I... Okay, do you know that it's not a knowledge claim? I, again, it's not a knowledge claim. So, okay, this might be easier then. What do you know to any degree and how do you know it? Again, you're using the term knowledge. Right. Justified true belief. Something which is true right. that you know that's justified to any degree and how do you know it? Well, uh, we'll use a street sign example. Right. Okay. I know that the speed limit on this street, I didn't look at this particular street, but just right. for sake of argument, let's say it's 30 miles per hour. <clears throat> I would look at the street sign. I would compare the lettering to my understanding of, of the numerals. That would be evidence that then supports the knowledge claim that the speed limit right. is 30 miles an hour. And now we go to the infinite regress. I would say there's many ways I could refute that. I would say how do you know that your senses and reasoning about what you think you see are valid? Because they have to be provisionally valid. They're, but the person who has invalid sense and reason could say exactly the same thing. But do you have an alternative? Yes. And the alternative to assuming that your senses and reasoning are at least provisionally valid would be? Revelation from God. You know, to be honest with you, we come to knowledge claims about things the same way. But the difference is that you cannot justify them. Because you justify something that has no foundation. You attempt to justify I know that I'm created in the image of God. I know that he's given me sense and reasoning such that I can come to knowledge claims using them. But you can't know that because you don't have that to appeal to. The problem with, with that is that your knowledge of God right. comes to you exactly the same way that any knowledge claim that I make. And it, well, that, my knowledge of God comes to me the same way it comes to you. Well, when you say revelation, right. explain to me what you mean by revelation. Well, I would say some ways he uh, reveals and the scripture says that everyone knows that God exists and are without excuse for their sin against him. That's what scripture says. So God reveals himself innately. He reveals himself many ways. For instance, you know that raping little children is wrong. You didn't, you didn't have to see anything written down to know that. And the reason that you know that's wrong is because you know that God exists. Because it wouldn't make sense to say, well, it's wrong because this society says it's wrong. Because you say, well, how do you know this society is right? And then you get that infinite regress again. Right. There's things that you know which expose your pre-commitment to God. And the fact that you do know things, and you do know things to be true, and knowledge and truth and these words do not make sense in a worldview that does not start with God. So you're saying in part, we can get into morality in a minute, but you're saying in, in part, revelation is reading scripture. Well, I would say some of it is innate, some of it is through scripture, 
And which, and I know where you're going with that, we use our sense and reasoning to read scripture. But then the question is, could the God of this universe reveal things to us through his word, through our fallible sense and reasoning, such that we can know them for certain? And from your worldview, you would have no basis to say, no, that's not possible. Because you would have to make a certain knowledge claim when you have no foundation to make an objection to it. Well, in that, that particular case, I can't answer that question because it's the, like the uni question. Right. Because I don't know what That's God right. Is. You cannot object to my claim to certainty that God reveals through his word. Right. I'm saying that is my claim. Now, you would have to admit that granting my worldview, granting that God exists, that he reveals in his word, I have an avenue to certainty. No. Okay. Now, are you certain that I don't? Yes. Okay. Now, you have denied certainty, and now you know for certain that I don't have that avenue. I've denied certain knowledge. Okay. But so, I can be certain because you, your logic is, is flawed, because you, okay. you've already expressed the contradiction. However, however... Wait, man, you, right. what, what you're saying, what you're saying is that you know something about God for certain, right. without the possibility of error, right. via your senses. No, your, I'm not, not saying that. Not by your senses? No, I'm saying that his existence, he's revealed wholly apart from our senses such that we're without excuse. Because people, for instance, in, in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa... Hand, hand. Right. He's revealed something apart from your senses. Right. There's something that he's revealed innately to us that you just know. And one of those things is the existence of God. And let me explain that to you. But you know, you just know, which means... Right. Are you saying that there's no justification for no, it? No, I'm saying that God justifies his revelation to us in many ways through his word. But but um, but specifically the this innate knowledge right. that you're talking about, what would be the justification for that? I don't need to justify that because everybody has it. But your definition of knowledge is justified true belief. Well, the thing is, I can't justify that in His Word, in His in His Word that He's revealed Himself to everybody. I can justify that. I can justify that to a Christian in a way that they would accept it. But my justification is going to be dependent on my worldview. And I ask you, well, how would I justify it according to your worldview? And you would say, I would need something that my senses and reasoning you know, could evaluate that God exists. And I'm saying, no, you can't even start with sense and reasoning unless you start with God. But I'm confused. Is your innate knowledge, is there a justification for your innate knowledge? Well, there is a justification. You said it wasn't. Then well, it was. no, no, the thing is, there is, but it depends on what you would accept the justification. I can open Romans 1 to you, and I can say, Here's my justification that everybody knows that God exists. And you say, well, that's not justification. I don't accept it as justification. Well, how do you define justification? Is it, is it justification and how do you define it? I would say that appealing to God's revelation is justification. Appealing and to I, could ju I could justify the fact that you know that God exists with your own internal knowledge. I know that you know that. I know that you're without excuse for your sin against Him. Because when I saw that video that you posted... I mean, I have seen refutations to presuppositional apologetics before, and that one was so bad that I thought to myself, this is not a refutation of presuppositional apologetics. This is a cry for help. <laughs> well, you can interpret anything you want. Right, so but when, I when, have no, no say in how you, how you want to interpret that. Right, but when you refutation. say that you end the infinite regress by appealing to senses, and even in the debate, I said, well, how do you know your senses are valid? That's not an end to the infinite regress. Because my next question is, how do you know your senses are valid? And when you give that answer, well, how do you know that? That's not an end to the infinite regress. And you've admitted you can't know that your senses are valid. So you can't know anything at all. And you have no basis from which to attack me. Now, one thing I do want to get into is, is the issue of truth. Because sure. you did talk about that. And you said you right. struggled with it a little while. Because you yes, said yeah. that I said one fizzing, one can of pop fizzing, another can of pop fizzing. How did they get to truth? And your resolution to that was that the light went on. You said, well, truth is not a physical thing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that truth is a physical thing. I'm saying that if our thoughts are the byproduct of our evolved brains, how do they get to an immaterial concept of this corresponds to reality? Because all your brain is doing is fizzing, and all my, my brain is doing is fizzing. So how do you get to an immaterial concept that corresponds with reality? Well, th again, you're, you're conflating terms here. As I said in the presentation, truth applies to propositions. So a proposition either maps to reality or it doesn't map to reality. In other words, if it maps to reality, it's true. If it doesn't map to reality, it's false. Right. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. And yeah. as, you know, I would even go so far as to agree with that definition. But the problem is, as you alluded to in that video, is how do you know what's real? Because, and you even mentioned the Hindus, the Hindus believe something else. And you say, well, truth is not which maps to a model of reality. Right. 
it models to actual reality. But you know what the Hindu will say? Actual reality is that all is illusion. All is one. And all this stuff we see is illusion. So their actual reality is that all is one. So how do you know who's right? Well, that's still a model of reality. No, no, no. Their, their model is that this is illusion. Their actual reality is that all is one. The problem is you can't step outside of the model. No, but that's the problem. They will have a different... They may have a different model. I okay, agree. Now, I'll, and, and, I'll, then, and then it's it dependent upon whether the evidence matches... But they will reject model. your evidence based on, based on what they think is actually real. They may. Right. So how do you differentiate? How do you know which one is true? Because it's still whether the evidence matches up to the reality. I know, but not. they will say that none of your evidence is sufficient because they believe all is one. Well, they, and any evidence they, that you try and... Right. Well, I understand. And, and they may, in fact, say that, and they would, in fact, be wrong. But how do you know that? Because, it would, because if it doesn't match up with reality, it doesn't match up with reality. But the thing that's, is... That's, that's the way we judge whether our models of reality are accurate or not. But and our, right. what we're, we're constantly doing is testing that model. Testing that model. Does the evidence match up? Do, is our model consistent? And when the evidence contradicts our model, we need to find a way to modify the model. All and right. we're, the, the problem with the presuppositional approach and religion or Christianity in general is there's no way to modify the model. Now, I say the model is already perfect. But Thank you. <laughs> what, you know, what, what you've done is you've set yourself up in a position where it's unfalsifiable. Right. Not only is it unfalsifiable, it's also indefensible because be, because you have no way of you've isolated yourself from all evidence. No, not at all. I'm saying all evidence points to God. But I'm saying that the very concept of evidence presupposes God. So I haven't isolated myself from evidence. I'm saying the very concept of evidence cannot be made sense of without God. I'll tell you what. I, I'll give you your argument. Thank you. If, and I think what you're doing, what you're essentially doing is you're equating, equating God with reality. No. God is a metaphor for reality. No. In that case, it, the, the reason why that makes sense is because um, it, it's a necessary precondition for intelligibility. You need to have something that's intrinsically coherent and consistent and existent, and that's exactly what reality is. But I'll tell you why that fails, though. Because if God is not a personal being, then how can reality reveal to you, how can you get information from reality such that you can have any knowledge to any degree? If there is no revelatory being, how can you know that the reality that you think you're experiencing is real? And since you said in your, in your, in your video that you cannot know that you're not being deceived, you can't know that. Well, but my uni, for example, reveals things to me all the time. Okay, but... Earlier, at the beginning of this discussion... Although it is personal, I'll grant that. At the beginning of the discussion, I asked you if that was your precondition for intelligibility, that being. And you said no, and now you're appealing to it that it is. No, I'm not appealing to it as my precondition for intelligibility. Uh, but I am saying it does reveal things to me. But you said God has to be personal, I think is where right. this started. Define for, what you mean, for me what you mean by personal. Well, I would say there's many aspects of it, but personal in that he's communicative. Okay. From one person to another, he has a, he's an immaterial person that can communicate, that can reveal to us in certain ways. Okay. If well, you don't have that personal relationship, right. that then like you could say, well, I believe that reality is God. So you can start there, but then my question comes back to, how do you know anything? Well, what you've done is you've used the term person in, in the definition of the term person. Um, so, <coughs> you, you personal. Well, he's communicative. Right. He loves. You know, he, he, he creates, he does things that a person would do, but he just does it in a, you know, in a grander scale. Right. Well, so I think you know what a person is, with something that's personal. That is not something that, that you know, an, an impersonal reality can do. An impersonal reality cannot impart knowledge to you. Oh, well, I disagree. Okay, okay, well then tell me something that you know right. to any degree yeah. based on what you think is real. Well... Let me go back and say, that this table sitting in front of us, would you right. consider this table personal? No, I would not. No, but yet it's communicating to It me. is communicating Yes. To okay. Well, not verbally. Okay, how is it communicating Well, there's light bouncing off of it. I can see that it's brown and gray and has a certain shape. But that's not communicating to you. That's you gleaning information from it without it doing anything. 
Of course. Okay, so that's not it being personal, not revealing to you. You are seeing things. Well, wait a minute. You're saying it's not doing anything. Right, it's not doing anything. Well, it's sitting there letting the light reflect off of it. Well, it's, it's not, not doing, doing anything, no. Well, it, it takes no... According you would, to my you would, definition... That okay, is that table a person? Does it reveal things to you? Depends on what you mean by person. Well, it's according to your definition, so you're saying it's it, possible. it communicates to me, so therefore it could be a person. Okay, now let's get back to our knowledge. What do you know? Do you know that there's a table there? I would say I know that okay. pro provisionally. Provisionally, you know. I know to what table. degree that you, do you know that there's a table there? I would say that a high degree of certainty. Okay, I, give a percentage to it. Well, I, I can't quantify High degree would be greater than 50%. Greater than 75%. <coughs> I'm very, I, I know, I can't, I can't give you a number. To what degree do you know that your sense and reasoning are valid? Um, I would say more often than not, yes, I would assume that okay. they're valid. Okay, to what degree, and what, would you say that it's a viciously circular argument to appeal to your sense and reasoning to validate your sense and reasoning? Would you say that's viciously circular? Uh, no, but let me ask you what you mean by viciously. Something which assumes the thing, like, where you're not appealing to something on another plane, it's like saying the sky is blue because the sky is blue. Right. You're, you're appealing to something on the, on the same plane, you know, you're, you're assuming something to be true in order to prove the argument on the same plane. You're saying the sky is blue because the sky is blue. That's a viciously circular argument. So would you say that I take my senses to be provisionally valid because of the impossibility of the contrary? Would, that be, would you consider that to be viciously circular? I would say that that's not visually circular, that's nonsense. Because you say, I take my senses to be provisionally valid. Yes. People with invalid senses could say the same thing. Of course they would. Right. So when you say that I take them to be provisionally valid, doesn't mean that they are. So when you start with doesn't that point... Doesn't mean that they're not. However, when you start there, it cannot result in knowledge to any degree. No, it can't result in certain knowledge, which is already no, impossible. No, to any degree. Because I say, what you said you have a high degree of certainty that that table is there. Right. Now I say, to what degree do you know that your senses are valid? And you cannot know that to any degree, because you appeal to them in a viciously circular fashion. But you just said it wasn't viciously circular. To appeal to your senses. Well, I said it's nonsensical. It is nonsensical and viciously circular. You're appealing to your senses to prove your senses. Which you admit, you would admit it's viciously circular. Because you would admit you could be a person. No, it's not viciously circular. Okay, well, hang on. First of all, I don't know what... Uh, you, you can use any adverb you want. Vicious or virtuous. That doesn't well, that, that's a big difference. It's either, it's either circular or it's not circular. Well, that, that's not... The thing is, you have to admit that some circles are valid. I'm not, I'm not saying... Well, I, I wouldn't say it's circular because I'm not saying my senses are valid because my senses are valid. You're just assuming that they are. I'm not saying... Well, not, and it's not just an assumption based on blind faith. What it is. It's, it's because of the impossibility of the contrary. Okay, but how that's do you know that the contrary is impossible? Give me an alternative. Okay, well, that's what, that's what we said. Now, now, let's say somebody with invalid senses say, I know that my senses are provisionally valid based on the impossibility of the contrary. How would you answer someone like that? I'm sorry, repeat that again? Somebody who says, I know that my senses are provisionally valid based on the impossibility of the contrary, and you know that their senses are not valid. So they could say the exact same thing as you, Yes. correct? They could say the same thing. Right, and how do you know you're not that person? Well, they, have no, they would have no uh, reason for reacting to the world at all. Right, but the it, thing is, they it, could be it, strapped face down to a bed in a psych ward right now. Yes, but... Uh, as, as you could be. Are all their sensory inputs invalid? Well, I'm saying that, that it would be possible for such a being to exist. It would be possible for such a being to have... To not be able to reason have, to logical conclusions. Would it be possible for uh, a being to exist that had no valid sensory input? I would, I would imagine that's, that would be possible, yeah. So they couldn't react to anything? Yeah, I, well, I think there's people you know, born without brains. I mean, those things are possible. Okay. However, the question is, how can you know for certain that you're actually here sitting here talking to me rather than strapped face down in a psych ward right now? And this is all just false information telling me that, you know, I accept my senses provisionally valid when you're really not even in this room. Well, that's, it, it, that's an interesting philosophical question. Right. It's possible that we're all, you're all figments of my imagination. I'm strapped down in some psych ward. Right. However, at some point, there's going to be evidence to that effect. How do you know that? Effect. How do you know that? Because there has to be, your, your senses must be provisionally valid. We've already discussed How do you know that? that? Because like you said, if there was no sensory input whatsoever, if, if absolutely none of it was valid, then you get to the point where you have no brain. Okay, now there, this, there's, you, you can't know 
anything. Now the problem is, Therefore, and, and, I heard, and I heard you say this in your debate too, that if we did not make this assumption, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't have interaction with reality if we didn't do that. But that does not justify its validity. It tells you the consequences of not doing that. And that's the fallacy of irrelevant thesis. Well, you use the term justification again. You've got to be careful about that because, I, I, again, I'm not calling it a justification. Well, then you, don't, you can't know anything to any degree, which is my no, point. There's, there's a reason for <laughs> Let's, um, maybe we'll kind of beat that one to death. No. It's important, though, because if we go on to talk to morale, about morality right. or anything like that, if we go on to talk about this, I'd be glad to do that. But you have to understand that we're doing it from the basis of the truth of my worldview. Because the thing is, if I say that you cannot know anything unless you start with the God of Scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden in Christ, that's my worldview. And you say, well, I can't know that I'm not strapped face down to a bed right now, then having this discussion about morality is not based on the potential of your worldview. It's based on the truth of my worldview. And but if you grant that, I'll be happy to discuss morality. As long as your worldview is the, what you're describing as God is, in fact, reality, God is a metaphor no, of reality. No, that's not what I'm saying. Have we discussed that already? That, it, the thing is, it makes, it makes no sense to redefine what I believe God is. I mean, you can either say, okay, this is your position, I disagree with it. Now, I want to assume that God is something else for my world, that's fine. But redefining my position doesn't make sense. Because God is not a metaphor for reality, according to my world. You know, if you want to define it that way, then you're debating somebody else. But everything that, that, that you use to try to extract God from, uh, from being just that as a metaphor for reality essentially collapses into, into nothing. I'll How do you, you know that? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, omnipotence, for example. It, in the debate, I asked you, you know, could God, could God lie? Well, first of all, is God omnipotent? Yes, God is. Yes, he is. Right. Which means, I, if I understand correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, which means there's nothing that God can't do. That's false. All right, so tell me what you mean by omnipotence. I mean, omnipotence is the is God's ability, His power, to do everything that corresponds with His will and His nature. Okay. God can do everything possible. God can do everything that's within His nature. Everything possible. Right. And it's not possible for God to lie, so we can't do that. Everything that's possible and in right. His nature. Right. Well, the thing is, God can own all things are possible, which it's only possible if it's within His nature. It's not possible for God to lie, so that does not qualify as a criteria for omnipotence, because that's not possible. Okay, well let me explain why that, that's, that ends up being meaningless. Well the thing is, you realize when you're doing this, you're boring from my worldview. Because, when, hang on, when you say that something is meaningless, you're boring from a foundation of knowledge and rationality, which you've yet to justify according to yours. Let, let, now, okay, let, let, me, let me explain. Are you going to tell me that it's absolutely meaningless, first of all? If you're going to tell me it's absolutely meaningless, I'd be happy to listen well, to Well, listen to my argument and you can, well, no, you I, can refute it. I, I'm interested in, when you say that something is meaningless, you're making a knowledge claim about meaning, that there is an absolute meaning and your definition of God is meaningless. It does not adhere to that, to that standard of meaning. I understand that you will not accept my reasoning as valid because no. you don't think I come from the same no, place. No, I'm saying, I'm saying that you cannot even begin the argument unless you start with the God of Scripture. I understand that you're saying that I can't. Okay, and, let's... And, and I accept that you're saying that. Right. But... Okay, let, let's... For the benefit of people what, watching the video... I'll let, you make your, I'll let you make your argument, but let's start with the fact you don't know that you're not strapped face down to a bed in the psych ward right now. Correct? Let, let, correct? Let me just make the argument. Is that correct, though? Let me make the argument. No, no, no but the thing is, I want to remind viewers that when we're going to have this argument about what is meaningless about God, that you don't know that you're not strapped face down to a bed in the psych ward. I'm not going to start with any preconditions. Mm -hmm. Let me just... No, I think it's important. Is there a problem? It's important. Pardon me? Take a break. Oh, okay. We need Something to take a break? <laughs> Is it getting too heated? <laughs> You're uncomfortable? Okay. No, but the thing is, now, when I agree to communicate, it, it's different, you know, when you're just having a talk around coffee or something, but you are a professed atheist who wants to debate Christians, who wants to talk about issues with, I'm saying, wait a minute, you can't even talk about that unless you start with my world. Now, you have admitted earlier, and people can watching this can rewind and say that you don't know that you're not strapped face down to a bed. When I bring that up again, in order, I don't know for certain. In order to concede you know, that you can have a discussion with me about God's nature, about stuff like that, then I want to get back and remind people to what you said. Okay. That you can't know that you're not strapped down, face down to a bed right now. Okay, so Correct? Now, now, you agree with that? Now that you've reminded you. You agree with that? I, you know, there's no sense not agreeing with it because you did admit it. 
And I would just like to start this next session with the fact that you don't know that you're not strapped face down to a bed in the fight. Okay. Excuse me. All right, certainly. Well, let me, let me talk about omnipotence. And, and as I was saying, why... Do you really... Do you know, do you know what happened just before you walked side out here? Please. Let me just explain. No, I, I've been I trying for 10 minutes to explain this to you. Yeah, I realize that. And, and I realize that we had a break there. But you have to understand my position. I understand your position. N may I please... Well, well, well... Can, can let, I let me put it, let me put it this Let me put it this way, though. You can explain it. But if you do not go back to that concession, then we're done. And I don't mind that. I don't mind that. I'm going to explain why. I'm well, then you're going to explain it to an empty room. Well, okay. Well, I'll talk to the camera then. But my the the problem with omnipotence. And I, okay. Well, I think we're done. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll talk to my camera because obviously you're really afraid to hear this because it's not a all. really critical point. Okay. Well, I actually, then say if you think I'm afraid to hear that, go ahead. Okay. Because I I think that you're afraid to admit that you what you conceded the, to 15 minutes. The problem ago. with omnipotence. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you which one of us is afraid here. Because I'm going to say, I'll listen to your definition of omnipotence and I'll refute it. But you are afraid to admit to what you admitted to 15 minutes ago, that you could be strapped face down to a bed in the cycle. You, You're you afraid to admit that, that. over and over right. again. And if, you had, and if you admitted it the first time, I would have only asked it once. You're trying to delay me from talking about omnipotence. No, no, if you had, asked it, if you had answered it the first time, you'd have been talking about omnipotence for 10 minutes already. But since you do not want to answer that, let's hear your thing I've on answered omnipotence. it. Omnipotence, okay, cool. omnipotence is a meaningless concept, even applied to your God, because Are you certain about you've that? qualified, you've qualified omnipotence to be the ability to do anything which is in the nature of the thing that's omnipotent. This, and I can claim exactly the same thing for this table, and I'm using this as an analogy. The table is omnipotent because it can do anything that's within its nature. Now, if I ask the table, please get up and make me a cup of coffee, and, and you said, well, that, of course, that's ridiculous. But that is possible, and that's the difference, because I said God can do all that which is possible yeah, let me finish. and within its nature. Let me finish. I, I can say it's still omnipotent because it's not within its nature. Right. Okay? If I, if I said my dog is omnipotent, uh, and you said, well, can it read the newspaper? And I said, well, that's not in its nature. It's still omnipotent. So what you can, the concept of omnipotence becomes completely vacuous no. because you, you can systematically exclude anything that could potentially be verified. Okay, now, are you certain about that? Give, give me an alternative. But that's not my question. My question is, are you certain about that? The reason I'm saying that omnipotence is becomes a vacuous concept. So you're saying is because the, the you use the term omnipotence because you want to grant to your God the ability to create and to do anything, anything that can be conceived. This God can do, but the, immediately when a contradiction like can he lie, which contradicts the rest of your position, comes up. It's immediately excluded from his nature and excluded from omnipotence. However, so omnipotence no longer is the what the general generally understood meaning of omnipotence no longer applies. Okay, but now you're appealing to things that you can't account for according to your world, because you can't account to that table to justify the absolute laws of logic by which you say that my definition is irrational. So my, my you cannot justify that. My right? reasoning stands on on its own, whether I'm saying it or not. Okay, it stands on its own. So you, do, you need no justification for your argument against omnipotence, is that correct? It, either my argument is correct or it's not correct. I, I agree with that. However, of the two of us, I'm the only one that can know that, and I say it's incorrect. That's not true, I've explained. We, okay, it's we, not true. We, now let's get to the uh, issue of truth. Since we've gone you know, beyond that, we've gone past omnipotence, we're talking about the issue of truth. How can you know anything to be true to any degree within your worldview? To any degree, to even 1% to be true. How can you know anything corresponds to reality to even 1% according to your worldview? Well, I can't quantify it, but... I no, but to any degree. Because you say, because the thing that you insisted in the video was that I insist on certainty. And I say, no, I'm saying that unless you start with the God of Scripture, unless you start there, you can't know anything to even 1%. 
and I'd like to know how you can know anything to even one percent. I'm not asking you for a certain claim. I'm saying how do you know anything to be true to even one percent? Because you would say you would ag admit that you cannot know something to be true which might be false. And if that's the case, know something to be true that might be false. Right. So you would say that knowledge is justified true belief. Yes. So to know something, it must be true. Correct. So you could not know something to be true which might be false. That logically follows. Would you say that that logically follows? The, the, the problem is that you, you've, you've set up a standard which in, in which case you require absolute certainty. No, no, we've agreed on justified true belief. That, to any degree. That's to any degree of knowledge, the, the thing known must be true, that's correct? A, that, that's a practical definition. I don't necessarily... So you don't adhere to that now? I don't think it's necessarily the best definition, okay. but it's a workable definition that we can use. Okay, so okay. you want to have a knowledge where you extract truth the, from the equation. The problem is, if you're setting up either truth or knowledge with absolute certainty, then no, you're never, not, you're never going to get there. Okay, is that true? You're in the same place. How do you know that? Is it true that you, I'm in the same place? Give me an alternative. I'm just saying, is it true that I'm in the same place? I'm not saying ask for an alternative. Well, it's really I'm asking you to justify your position. You know, I understand why people get so frustrated with yes. it. Because people, <laughs> they answer the question, you're unwilling to accept the answer, and, and well, I don't think you really you're, you're question, appealing yeah. to exactly the same thing. It's uh, again, it's it starts with the axiom okay, because of the un impossibility of the contrary, which is exactly where you are, and your axioms are eff effectively okay, uh, effectively what you're calling God, uh, and uh, then it's morphed into the Christian God through Let me give you a hypothetical like there. morality See, and the Trinity. And so that's a misunderstanding of presuppositionalism too, by the way. We, it's not all of this, therefore God. It's God, therefore you can make sense of all the rest. I understand. However, this is not my axiom, but I'm going to give it as a hypothetical axiom. My axiom is that God exists. I understand. Right. Okay, now your axiom is that he does not. No. Well, your axiom is that God is not necessary for knowledge. My, let, 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 let's change that. My axiom is that God is necessary for knowledge. Hypothetically, your axiom is that God is not necessary for knowledge. Would you admit that? Uh, I, I wouldn't state it that way. I wouldn't say that axiom is. Well, you would. God is not necessary for knowledge. Uh, you would say that knowledge is gained without God. Based upon reasoning, the the irony is, if God exists, at least the commonly understood biblical Christian God, if that God exists. We can't know anything. Well, hang on. Let, let's just get back to our axioms. Our axioms, they, they differ. My, if my hypothetical axiom is that God exists and is necessary for knowledge, your axiom includes God not being necessary for knowledge. Your axiom, if, if your axiom is that I can know things through senses and reasoning, to whatever degree, that, that would be your starting point. It would be, it would be your starting point that God is not necessary for knowledge. That is your fundamental bedrock starting point that knowledge is gained without God. Correct? It's possible to gain knowledge... Uh, without well, God. Because you said that you could have knowledge and you avoided the infinite well, regress without God. That was your whole video was about. The, actually, the problem is I don't know what God is. Well, I, I gave a definition. However, since you don't know, given that you don't know, I'm saying that you, you do know, that you do, and that's why you're without excuse for your sin against Him. But given your argument that you don't know, your axiom is a justification for knowledge without God. Correct. Uh, no, I wouldn't call it my, my axiom. My axioms are my axioms. Right, your axiom, you have an axiom, a bedrock for knowledge. Right, my, my axiom... And God is not included in that. I agree with that. Now, my axiom, God is included in that. Well, it's, Hypothetical. But wait a minute. If you, the problem is, if you say that God is not included, that implies that, that a God exists. No, I, I'm just saying that... But what, I don't know what that is. That, that's fine. I'm just saying... Obviously, it's not included since you don't know what it is. I don't so you got, even we say blark, whatever. In fact, it can't exist. Well, however, your axiom is that such a being is not necessary for knowledge because you can't define it whatever reason. I, again, I wouldn't call it an axiom, but I have concluded. Well, no, no, no. You have axioms. We're talking about axioms now. Foundational yes. knowledge axioms. Yes. That you can know things apart from this nebulous being that you can't define. Well, again, if, it, the problem it's is... It's not that difficult then. It, I know it's not difficult. The problem, but the problem is that, that doesn't mean there aren't problems with it. The problem is that this God idea can can still be equivalent to reality. 
Well, now the, the reality existing okay, is one of my axioms. Let's, so if God is real, it's metaphor. Let reality, me make that easier for you then. then. Your bedrock axiom does not include my definition of the God of Christianity. That would be fair, wouldn't you? Do, wouldn't you say? It's not one of my axioms. Sorry. That's right. It's not foundational to your axiom for knowledge. Yeah. The God of Christianity. Provided it's something other than. A well, obviously it's not. Obviously it's not the God that it's not equivalent with reality. It's something else, and that is not included in your. Now, my axiom, hypothetically, because I would not call God an axiom, however, I would say... My axiom, hypothetically, is that God is necessary for knowledge. Now, those are two axioms that conflict. How do you determine who has the right axiom? The only way that I, the only reason uh, I, I choose the axioms that I have are the, is the impossibility of the contrary. Okay, now, but when you say something is impossible, you realize that you're appealing to a certainty, which you deny well, because how do you know that the contrary is impossible? Let me ask you this. That's how I pick my axioms. Your axiom is okay. that God exists. How, how do you determine your axiom? He's revealed it to me the same way he revealed it to you. So that's why you're without excuse when you stand before him on judgment day, and that's why you need to repent. Because Jesus Christ did not only die to save souls for eternity, he died to save reasoning now. Gotcha. And hopefully when you become a Christian when and watch back your video, he that you scratch your head too and reveals, say, this is a cry for help. When he reveals to you, Essentially, is, is your method of gaining knowledge, correct? He, there's many methods with, by which I but gain that's knowledge. One. But he reveals to me such that I can know for certain. So that like I can know things based on my sense and reasoning. And I'll give you an example of that for the people but that are watching this. Let, well, let me give you an example before we go on. Go ahead. Okay, now, for instance, in Scripture, it says, Thou shalt not steal. So I know that I can know things for certain with my senses, which is my car, which is not my car, so that I can obey that command. Because God has said in his word that we can know things through our senses. And that's my justification, appealing to revelation from God. But you, as you admitted not too long ago, don't know that you're not strapped face down to it. So you can't know anything. So right what now. you've done is you've taken a knowledge claim and made that the basis for supporting your axiom. I'm saying that God is not an axiom. He's a necessary precondition. There's a difference. And there's even some divisions within the presuppositional camp who say God is an axiom. Because an axiom is something that is not provable. Because you have said that an axiom is a necessary truth. That's not a definition of an axiom. Well, that's my definition of axiom. You well, you can, you can, you can say an axiom is green cheese. But you have to go with a philosophical definition of something that's not provable. I have to? No, you don't have to. You can, you can call it something else. But then, you know, it's no sense debating me. Who wants to use actual definitions? <laughs> as, as long as we're clear on what the term means, then, I mean, that's what language is all about. Okay. Is that is conveys conceptual cargo because the transmitter and the receiver have the same concept. Of okay, so your idea. definition of axiom is a necessary truth. It's a necessary truth. Okay, now my hypothetical axiom is that God exists, and I'm saying that's a necessary truth. But you're supporting your axiom. No, I'm saying if you don't start there, no, it's axi it's axiomatic. God exists. That's that's the axiom. God exists. Okay. You have an axiom because of the impossibility of the contrary. Right. Okay, which is what Greg Bonson said, is the impossible. Well, no, Greg, I, I, trust me, I know a lot about his teachings. He says by the impossibility of the country, but he does not call God an axiom. I agree with that. Okay. But he uses the, the justification, the if you would, depending on the use of justification. Okay, now the question is, and this is, I'm actually very glad you brought this up, because a lot of presuppositions don't get this. How does Greg Bonson know that the country is impossible? Well, that's a good question. How do you know the country is well, impossible? Well, you've studied this. How does he know the country well, is involved? I'm a relative amateur. I've only well, I'll tell been you involved what, for a few months. There's only one way you can know. It's not by refuting all the other worldviews. That's not how we know that the country is impossible. Do you know how we know? Because God tells us. Again, that's a knowledge claim. So you're using a knowledge claim to support right. but the difference an is, axiom. But the difference is we're not, we're not appealing to something on the same plane. We're appealing to a God outside of this plane who transcends this plane, who reveals to us. And you cannot counter that claim because you don't know if you're not strapped face down to a bed right when you say outside the plane you're saying outside of reality no, no i'm not saying that i'm saying outside of our temporal plane well we understand there are things that you know are beyond our understanding of this is in isaiah god's thoughts are, are not our thoughts so when you try to explain something even when i try to explain omnipotence i'm doing that as a fallible being you know and i'm trying to explain the characteristics of god it's like you asking me to explain the trinity to you. I'm going to fail in that definition, but the only thing is that that argument only makes sense in my worldview because I know for certain that I'm not strapped face down to a bed now. So that argument makes sense in my worldview or it doesn't make sense in yours. Because your senses are perfect. 
No, not perfect. Well, how can See, you, you, you not, you've got these multiple layers. You've got this information coming to you via your senses. And I don't want to belabor this with you over and over. But it's a fallacy of hasty generalization to say that I can know something through my senses, therefore they're perfect. Because you would admit that God can reveal some things to me through my fallible senses such that I can know them for sure. God could do that. So, so what would you, you admit that? You're telling me that... Well, you, would you admit that? I mean, I've been answering your question, so I think it's fair that God can reveal things to me through my fallible senses such that I can know them for certain. You're saying... <laughs> you you're saying... You're saying... You're saying that you have this conduit... So for, do you. For infor yeah. I, you have From this, God. The God you, you know you exists. You have this conduit you that? of <laughs> information coming to you via your senses that you could know without the possibility of error Some things. despite the fact that your senses could potentially be in error. Exactly, that's exactly right. Okay. I know some things for certain through my fallible senses because God reveals things to me through my fallible senses such that I can know them for certain. Same way he does to you. Because the thing is, you do know things. You do know things for certain. And that's another mistake that people make. I'm not saying that atheists don't know things. The problem is... Hang on, like, I'm not saying that atheists don't know things. I'm saying they do know things. But they suppress the truth and unrighteousness about their only possible justification for knowledge, the God who knows everything. The problem is, what you've just admitted to me is a direct contradiction. That, that, that you can have perfect knowledge via your imperfect senses. I can know some things perfectly. Not that I can have perfect knowledge, there's a difference. I know some things for certain through my fallible senses, and you're telling me that that's absolutely impossible. Well. It's a contradiction. Okay, a contradiction is absolutely fallacious. Um, something cannot be A and not A why at the not? same time in the same manner. You disagree with that? I do not, but I'm asking you why not, because I can justify that in my world. Because I believe in a logical God. Because of the but impossibility of the why contrary. Why is it not very impossible? Because reality is inherently consistent, which excludes contradiction. How do you know that reality will be consistent tomorrow? It's not a knowledge claim, which gets back to our very first discussion okay. about what counts for so justification. So what is it? What is it then? What is? It's a statement of fact. I'm sorry. What What is that? That a cannot be both a and not a at the same time in the same. Way? You don't know that, right? You I, don't know that a can be both a and not a at the same it's time. It's not a knowledge claim. So you don't. So if there's not a knowledge claim, you don't know it. The pro The problem is every time you say you don't know that or you can't know that, when you use the term no, for most people listening or watching this. There's a, a parochial understanding of the term no. That's right, okay. and they reject God in order to make that, and that's why we're but here doing we're this. using a technical definition of the word no. So you're, what you're trying to do is create the impression that I cannot possibly be correct when in fact I'm not making a knowledge claim at all. So it's, it's, that, it's that twisting of the word no I'm not saying into you can't a position be where it sounds superficially plausible. I'm not saying that you can't be correct. I'm saying that you can't know it to be correct. Am I? So I'm. So, a, so when you make a, a claim, can, a can be a and not a at the same time in the same manner. You're the law of non contradiction I agree with that, but I have a justification for it. So and I correct. know that I know that that's that's right. You are correct, but you can't know it. That's the difference. I, so when you object, <laughs> when you say there's a contradiction in my worldview, you're borrowing from my worldview because you can't know it. Because you are, and that, you know, you bring up a very good point. You're bringing up absolute truths, which you can account for. And you know these things to be absolutely true because you know the God that exists. You know the justification for them. Because I, if I say to you, how do you know that A cannot be both A and not A at the same time in the same way? You can say, well, you agree with that. Of course they do, because I believe in God. But you reject them. How do you know that A cannot be both A and not A five seconds from now? How do you know that? Oh, you're talking about uniformity of nature. It's kind no, of where this is going? Well, no, I'm just saying anything. Of course, it depends on uniformity. However, one thing that you said is in, your, in that video is that nature is uniform by the impossibility of the contrary. Okay. Right. Why does it have to be uniform? Well, what's the alternative? Non-uniform. As Shakespeare said, sound and fury signify nothing. Well, Why can't that be the case two well, seconds from now? It depends on what you mean by uniform. Well, things that follow in, a, in an orderly succession. Okay. So we, we still have cause and effect. So well, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Isn't that... Cause and effect has applied in the past. Yeah. But how do you know that's going to apply two seconds from now? What's the alternative? The alternative is that it doesn't. And is that a rational concept? Is that, is that it doesn't a, matter. How do you know coherent? that rationality will apply two seconds from now? Because I'm asking you something about the future. Could we have coherence and intelligibility? No. All right, so then, so uniformity 
is a precondition of intelligibility. Absolutely. Okay. Right. How do you know there's going to be intelligibility five seconds from now? Because it's it's necessary because of the impossibility of the contrary. So you're saying that it's necessary that there's going to be intelligibility in five seconds. How would you say that we're, it's going to be uniform? Five How seconds do I know that? Yeah. From God's promises. God is a is a God who controls His universe such that we can have dominion in it. So you have a knowledge claim via your your, your uh, fallible senses. That's right. That uniformity right will be will extend into the right. future. Right. Right. Which I know for certain. Which also implies that non-uniformity is a possibility. No. That what what it says, and this is a mistake. Another mistake that presuppositionalists make is that that the uniformity of nature, that the scientific laws are an absolute. That's not true for a Christian. Because in Genesis 8.22 it says, Seed time will follow harvest as long as the earth endures. Because for instance, the second law of thermodynamics that things produce to their state of chaos, I don't think that's going to apply in the new world. In heaven, I don't think that things are going to decay like that. So I'm not saying that these laws are absolute, but the non-believer must admit that they are, otherwise you couldn't even speak. See what happens, you're thinking words to utter to me right now in response to what I'm saying. You're thinking words and you're going to open your mouth and utter sounds based on the fact that you believe that those sounds mean the same thing they did five seconds ago. But that doesn't make sense unless you start with God. Because you have no basis... Just to say we need Sorry. to about five minutes. Okay, if that's the case, unless you have another question, I do have a question for you. Go ahead. Now, because it very rarely in these types of debates does the issue of the gospel get out. Now, the thing that I would like to know is if you could explain what you understand of the gospel to me. What I understand of the gospel? Yes. Well, I mean, what is the gospel is of Jesus any, Christ? What is the? Because I think a lot of Christian, Christians get that wrong. So I just, I want when I get up and walk away from this conversation with you, and you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, I just want to be sure that you're rejecting that you know what you're rejecting. Well, what because you if you're rejecting a, a nebulous concept of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, then you know that's a failing of mine. I think that I don't want to leave you without you understanding the gospel. So I would like to know because you've met like Christians, you've debated Christians. I'd like to know your understanding of what the gospel is. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, at its, you're talking about the four books of the New Testament. No, no, not 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 the Gospels, not the written Gospel, but what Christ did oh, for what? mankind, and and, and the, basically the story according to Christianity of salvation, redemption, and sin. Do you understand what that is, and what Jesus Christ has done for His people? <laughs> you're putting me in the position of. of uh, if you're uncomfortable with of, that, but I'm just being curious. a Christian. I mean, I, I can tell you what my and then there's lots of different angles in which I right. can answer that question of what my my understanding of the whole Christian well, experience is. Could I break it down for you then? Yeah, be okay. more specific. According yeah. to Christianity, what would you say is the purpose of mankind? Uh, according to is to serve God. To glorify Him, to enjoy Him forever. Yeah. Correct. Right. Now, why is man in a condition of needing a Savior? Uh, well, there's lots of different schools of thought on that, but it has to do with uh, his sinful nature. Okay, now, do you understand what sin is? Do I understand what sin is? A sin is an offense against God of some type. Okay, but, but what is the foundation for why something is sinful? Is it an arbitrary decree of God? It's or is it some standard that God appeals to in order to call something sinful? Or why is something sinful? Well, my understanding is it's how a violation of his nature. Of his nature. Yeah. Correct. Okay, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen some of my debates too. I say, why is stealing wrong? Not because of an arbitrary decree of God, or not because of something that God appeals to, because then you wouldn't need God for that. Stealing is wrong because God is not a thief. And we're created in His, in his image. When we steal, we lie about who God is. So that being the case, that God has put us on this earth to glorify Him, to represent Him. And when we sin, we violate His nature. Correct? I, I understand you believe right. that. No, okay, no, but that, I just want to make you, I just want to leave you understanding the Christian position. So we have all done that according to Christianity, right? Well, but you can understand how that could also be interpreted as if God is a metaphor for reality or metaphor for, for nature, as it were, then uh, a, a sin would be something that, that violates uh, the nature. But nature doesn't care. Our nature. But nature doesn't care. Well, it, Because the thing is, because Jeffrey Dahmer would have a nature that he would have evolved to eat people and to store them in his fridge. I mean, and the thing is, he did not violate his nature, he did something according to his nature. Well, what we're getting into... Is, according to your view. Is, ...is really the foundation of morality. Right, however... The, 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 the problem with that is, in general morality, and I'll make 
this, I'll try to make it brief because we're running out of time, but right. the, the problem in general with religious morality, any morality that's based upon uh, a book or if you'd say the nature and character revelation of God. is that morality ends up being static. In other words, we're, we're stuck with whatever it is that's revealed. So you us. have a worldview in which raping children might be right someday. No, well, that's pro- static. No, no. The problem, the problem. If you say rape, for example, the problem is that it. No, I say it, rape children, for example. An act is immoral, based upon uh, the circumstances and the consequences of the act. Oh yeah, who says? That's the common understanding of the term morality. Yeah, now, okay. Well, we can define. So it's morality. done by vote. Now your 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 definition of morality is different than mine. Your definition Obviously. of morality actually divorces. Yours can change. Divorces the action from the consequences. No, I'm saying there are consequences to violating God's nature. But the consequences yeah, but are con- not the reason it's wrong. Right, exactly. Right. That, and that's why I because mean... Because the it, consequences, the according to your view, are arbitrary. No. Yeah, because cause you could say, well, the consequences of that rape is that that person feels pain. Well, the rapist enjoys it. So you could say, for my consequences, well, I think that's fine. But anyhow, we're getting way off topic. We're getting to the gospel. Yeah. So the I, I presentation... You, you asked me about the gospel. Yeah, though. right, but I'm just trying to explain it to you. So the gospel presentation that but we that, have... But I can't... Ex- and I can't... I understand that, but I'm just explaining it to you so that I actually feel um, that when I leave you, that I've left you with something, at least trying to explain it to the, to the best of my ability. I understand. Okay, now we've all violated God's nature. And because we have done so, we are you imperfect. So. Well, because according to Christianity, we have done so. We are imperfect. And we have put ourselves at enmity with God. We've become en- enemies with God. And we, being sinful people, cannot pay that debt. And we deserve an eternity in hell because of that. Now, and I know we're just, running out of time. Sorry, just, just for the record, yeah. I don't think you deserve that. Okay, well, I do. And I know that. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, just psychologically, don't you think that's destructive? Not at all, because I know I'm not going. I know I'm not going. That's why it's not destructive. Would it be destructive to people that... that somehow would believe that they are. But, but even the idea you know, that somehow that would be a question worthy, for you to answer. That, that somehow you're worthy of, of that. I am. And I'm going to explain that to you. Because people often but ask... But you're not going because of God's grace. Is that That's it? right, because of what His Son did. Because he, because of what His Son did. What is right. it? But it, so we have... I'm glad that we're getting to the Gospel. Vicarious uh, That's uh, right. redemption. Because I cannot pay that. A sacrifice on my behalf. So, Jesus Christ. God being omniscient, right. knew in advance that you were going to be worthy of eternal torture. Exactly. Okay, yet He created you that way anyway. No. He, he created, he, everything happens according to God's plan. Right. So, and I'm an atheist because of, according to God's According plan. to God's plan. But the thing is, now this is a, a question people ask, why do I talk to atheists? Why do I pray for atheists as I pray for you, as my friends here have prayed to you? Why do I do that? If you're an atheist and God knows for certain where you're going to end up. Do you know why I do that? And this is how I answer that question. Let's say God knows for certain that I'm going to have a full stomach tonight. Would it make sense for me to say, well, then why eat? No. Because the means by which God fills my stomach is by my eating. And the means by which God saves people is by my talking to them, by my coming to debate them, by my praying for them. God uses us worms, and it says in the Psalms that we are worms, for His glory, for His purpose. And I hope that you are one of His sheep. Because the Bible talks about goats and it talks about sheep. One thing it never says is that goats become sheep. It says, my sheep hear my voice. Now, when I walk away from here, and if you do not become a Christian, and if you die in your sin, then this is not a good thing for you. Because I'm giving you a lot of truth. And when you investigate my worldview, you're getting a lot of truth. And if you die in your sin rejecting that, it's going to be worse for you. But it has to be a good thing. No matter what happens, it has to be a good thing for me. Not for you. Oh, for me? No. Because Because it's part of God's God works all things for the good of the... No, it would be good but not for you, because God works good. So it would be good for God. That's right. God works all things for the good of so those tor- who love Him. Torturing me forever would be good for God. He will get glory from it. That's he will right. get glory That's by right. torturing me forever. That's right. He will get glory from all things. And God works all things for the good of those who love Him. And that's why I'm not saying it's going to be good for you. It will be miserable for you. And that's why I urge you to repent of your sin. So he, and put your trust in Jesus he Christ. He glorifies the only in, in my eternal turf. Ter- God is glorified by everything that happens. Nothing happens outside of His plan. Oh, so there's nothing that wouldn't glorify Him. That's right. So that you can, can't sin. No, I'm saying that my sin is according to His plan and He gets glory from it. I don't know how. And this is how I explain it to some people. And this is a question I ask. I say, if I was about to stick a knife into the... If, okay, let me put it this way. If a man was about to stick a knife into the chest of a three-year-old girl, would that be evil? 
A man was about to stick a knife in the chest of his... It depends upon the circumstances. That's right. Okay. Because a lot of people say to me, yes, that would be evil. And I say, well, I'm going to give you some more information. This girl has a heart defect. She's going to be dead in a week if she doesn't have surgery. Right. And that man who's about to stick the knife in her chest is a surgeon. Because this girl couldn't afford the surgery and he's offered to pay for it for free. She's on an operating table under, under anesthetic and the knife he's about to stick in her chest is a scalpel. He's about to save her life. Yeah, that's a, Okay, so that's the question per is... a perfect example of right, why well, you can have absolute well, let morality. Well, let me finish. Because it depends upon the circumstances. That's right, but who knows all the circumstances? God knows all the circumstances. That's right, but God knows all the circumstances. And that's why when things happen to me, when I watch my father's body rot away from adult diabetes, when I watch him lost, lose both his legs, paralyzed on one side, I could praise God because I know that God works all things for His glory, for the, for the good of those who love Him. And I know that my father loved Him. I know that I love Him. That's what I could rejoice and praise God in the miserable times. Because I know that I love Him. I know that He loves me. And that's what I wish for you. I didn't come here to arrange to do this because when I saw... That video, I said, it's really senseless. It's really senseless to come and talk for the argument, but I'm here for you. And that's why these people are here, and they pray for you. And thanks for making the time. Come well, on. I thank you for come the time, man. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.